Okay. My name is Rachel. The reading this morning is from Mark 3, 20 to 35 from the Common English Bible. Jesus entered a house. A crowd gathered again so that it was impossible for him and his followers even to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they came to take control of him. They were saying, he's out of his mind. The legal experts came down from Jerusalem. Over and over they charged. He's possessed with Beelzebub. He throws out demons with the authority of the ruler of demons. When Jesus came, when Jesus called them together, he spoke to them in a parable. How can Satan throw Satan out? A kingdom involved in civil war will collapse, and a house torn apart by divisions will collapse. If Satan rebels against himself and is divided, then he can't endure he's done for. No one gets into the house of a strong person and steals anything without first trying, tying up that strong person. Only then can the house be burglarized. I assume you that human beings will be forgiven for everything, for all <clears throat> sins and insults of every kind, but whoever insults the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. That person is guilty of a sin with consequences that last forever. He said this because the legal experts were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. His mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside and sent word to him, calling for him. A crowd was seated around him, and those sent to him said, Look, your mother, brothers, and sisters are outside looking for you. He replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Looking around at those seated around him in a circle, he said, Look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. In this reading, we hear God's voice. Thanks be to God. Oh, let's gather our hearts in prayer. Holy God, be near to each one of us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, you don't have to say this out loud, but how did you respond to that opening hymn? My guess is that some of you found it delightful and refreshing. Um, my guess is that some of you maybe had a little bit of a bristle, perhaps at the word queer, or perhaps that a beloved hymn has totally had the words changed. People don't like us messing with tradition sometimes. Queer is an interesting word. For most of its history, back to the 1600s, queer meant odd or strange, peculiar. About 100-ish years ago, maybe 150 years ago, queer began to turn into a, an insult, a slur against anyone who had any whiff of LGBTQ-ness about them. Um, and then in the 1980s, I think, the 2S LGBT community took this slur, this insult, and they transformed it and adopted it and said, that's who we are. We are queer, uh, and turned it into a banner, a, a badge of honor. Today, the word queer can be, is an umbrella term for the 2S LGBTQIA community. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a decade-ish ago or so, we sometimes used gay as an umbrella term for all, but now queer is that word. Now, you have to be a little careful because not everybody identifies with that. I, I've found that particularly older people who are gay or lesbian sometimes don't, you know, like so much the word queer. Um, but uh, queer encompasses the gender diversity as well as the sexual orientation uh, parts of it. In general, though, people struggle with anything that is peculiar, that is different from us. It's probably a, it goes back to a caveman, goes back to the caveman kind of thing. That's what I want to focus on today in the scripture that Rachel read. He's out of his mind. That's what Jesus' family 
and the religious authorities said about Jesus. In our scripture reading, Jesus is called out by two groups for being strange and not behaving normally. In this reading, both his family and the religious authorities seek to take control of Jesus and to put him back on track. They want Jesus to straighten out and fly right. The first group is his family. We don't have the whole story, so we have to kind of read into it a little bit, but it's clear that they are not happy with how things are going. He's always been such a good boy, and now he's not behaving the way they think he should be behaving. He's out of his mind. Other translations read, he is beside himself. In other words, his family has a sense of who Jesus is and who he should be, and he wasn't behaving that way. He's outside of himself, according to his family. Now, part of this, I believe, is genuinely rooted in care and concern for Jesus. Listen again to this. Jesus entered a house, he's in his home community, a crowd gathered again so that it was impossible for him and his followers to even eat. When his, father, when his family heard what was happening, they came to take control of him. They were saying he's out of his mind. Things are nuts. The crowd is so big and demanding that neither Jesus nor his followers have time to eat. And in this story, I believe that they had some good intention and some selfish intention. Um, sometimes people are their own worst enemy. Sometimes people genuinely need an intervention, right? Sometimes the most loving thing to do is to say to someone, your behavior is harming yourself. Your behavior is harming your relationships, it's harming your work, it's harming your life, and we think you need to change, and we're here for you. That's essentially what the family, they're, they're staging an intervention on, Jay's, on Jesus today. So I think that there's a little bit here that it has genuine care. However, it's pretty clear to me that this intervention also has an element of fear and selfishness in it. My hunch is the family didn't like all the drama that was going around. They certainly didn't like any conflict with the authorities. They may even be, um, they may be afraid of the conflict, they may be embarrassed or ashamed by this unwanted attention. How will this reflect on us? What will they think of us? Jesus' culture was a big honor and shame culture. Everyone stood on a scale of being honorable or being shameful. And uh, just as a note, if you were to kind of read the Gospels with that lens of an honor and shame culture, you'll, you'll, you'll see it a little bit differently and a little bit more deeply. You know, what was the, uh, your goal was to have a live a life of honor. And when you lived a life of honor, that would um, echo out to your family for sure. And it would echo out to your tribe and your community and vice versa. If you were a person who is shameful, that would kind of bleed into your family and your, your immediate uh, community. What does, a, what does an honorable lo life look like? Well, think of somebody coming, riding into Jerusalem on a horse with legions of soldiers around them. What does honor look like? Well, it looks like standing up in a pulpit dressed in colorful ve vestments. Honor, right? It looks, like, it looks like having the best seat at the table. Honor. Now think about Jesus and his life coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, taking the lowest seat at the table, eating with unclean people, shame, shame, and then at the end of his life, dying as a common 
criminal, the most shameful thing you could imagine. And this reflect, not just reflecting, but like infecting his family, those closest to him. Jesus didn't do, didn't lean into this be, for the fun of it, but because so much of Jesus' life was turning upside down what we understand as being God's idea of honor and shame, God's idea of what is good and what is bad. Jesus turns so much of it upside down. Well, that come, takes us to the second group who come out against Jesus, um, the religious authorities. I don't think anybody likes to be in conflict with authorities, with people of power. Uh, it's not just the local authorities who come down for Jesus, the legal experts from Jerusalem come to take control of this situation. Whereas his family thinks that Jesus has, has lost his mind, the religious authorities think that he is possessed. They think he's evil, that it is Beelzebub, the prince of demons who is at work in Jesus. And a side note on that, um, the scripture verse, Jesus talks about all will be forgiven except the sin of grieving the Holy Spirit, and people get kind of freaked out about that. Um, but what's happening here is that the religious authorities fail to recognize the spirit that Jesus is working from, that Jesus is, embodies the Holy Spirit, absolute goodness, and the religious authorities don't recognize it, not only don't recognize it, they flip it around and say, no, this is evil. So they call what is God and holy and good, they call it evil. That's the, the grieving of the Holy Spirit. Deny God's holiness and goodness. It reminds me a little bit of that C.S. Lewis quote about the divinity of Jesus that maybe you remember. C.S. Lewis said that, um, that it, it was sort of nonsense to claim that Jesus was a great moral teacher. Um, he said, we can't say that. This is C.S. Lewis here. He says, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Lewis says you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut Jesus up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And Lewis says, now it seems obvious to me that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that Jesus was and is God. But I find it interesting that you see right in this passage, some say he's mad, some say he's evil, and then we have Jesus. Here's the thing. The family of Jesus and the religious authorities see Jesus as being strange, queer, not in his right, uh, he outside of himself. His family eventually comes around, at least as we know his mother does. His mother follows him to the cross. The authorities never do come around. The religious authorities are the ones who end up having Jesus crucified. But to the disciples and to those of us who have said to Jesus, you are Lord, I love you, I want you to come into my life, we know that Jesus is not only off-center, he is the center. Jesus is perfectly centered and rooted in God. 
Jesus isn't eccentric and queer and strange for the fun of it. He was born that way. He was born to live out and be the person God created him to be. To those of you who are part of the queer community, I want to say that I am sorry if you have ever felt judged by the church or by anyone who calls themselves a Christian. Even yesterday at our pride parade, there was someone with a loudspeaker uh, calling on people to uh, turn from their sins. And if you've heard that, I'm sorry. It's part of the reason it's so important for Wall Street to be in the parade. Once again, I think we were the only church in Brockville to show up for the Pride Parade. And I don't quite get that because it seems to me that there are more and more churches in the community who uh, affirm um, people of all gender and sexual diversity and, and sexual orientations. The second thing I want to say is that Jesus experienced something similar. If you've been rejected by your family, or if you have been afraid to come out and be authentically who you are, who you were created to be, because of fear of what your family or other groups in the community might think, I'm sorry. Those of us who are heterosexual and cisgendered, cisgendered meaning you're the gender, I was born female, I'm still female, that's cisgender. Those of us who are heterosexual and cisgender have no idea how difficult it is to come out and to face that potential kinds of rejection. But I want you to see that Jesus risked rejection from his own family. When they come to take control of him, um, Jesus, they, they say, you know, so that, or people come to Jesus and they say, look, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside looking for you. And do you remember how Jesus replies? He says, who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters? And looking around to those seated in a circle, he said, look, here are my mothers, my brothers, and my sisters. In other words, rooted in God's love for him, Jesus has belonging in him. And so Jesus will find belonging right where he is. I know many of you have experienced that rejection from your family, perhaps for different reasons. Tune in to what Jesus has done here and find your new family. Find the gifts that God has given you, a new family. Jesus' sense of ident identity and belonging is rooted in God, and even if the world rejects him, he will find that, uh, that identity. And of course, the world does reject him. Those crowds who are right around him will eventually cry, crucify him. From the cross, Jesus forgives those who have rejected him. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He prays forgiveness, but he's not thrown off by their rejection. How I long to be more like Jesus. Jesus remains true to himself, true to God, and he remains strange in the eyes of the world. I'm always so impressed by people who come out of the closet because it takes such huge courage to do so. I'm impressed, I think, because I struggle a little bit myself with what others think. But I remember with so much love and fondness, Heather Irely. Heather passed away of breast cancer seven years ago at the end of this month at the age of 46. She and Suzanne Bergeron, who's watching online, hi Suzanne, um, were the first same-sex wedding in this church, and it was such a wonderful, joy-filled, uh, lots of people here in the, in the sanctuary. It was just an amazing event. Heather was so open. 
She didn't just sneak out of the closet. It was like she opened the closet and there were spotlights on her and she jumped out and said, ta-da, I'm here and I'm fabulous. After their wedding ceremony, Suzanne and Heather uh, toured around Blockhouse Island in a convertible and invited the community to celebrate their love and their wedding. Those are some great pictures. Her license plate said, be yourself. I can't remember the exact you know, lettering, but be yourself. And I remember when they went to the US for their, their honeymoon, and Heather was driving, and as she approached the border, the US uh, border guard, of course, asked the purpose of their visit, and she didn't even hesitate to, to say, we just got married, and we're on our honeymoon. And the border guard said, oh yeah? I guess you're being yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, there is so much freedom in being the person you were created to be instead of being the person that your family thinks you ought to be, that your community thinks you should be. Diversity is God's idea. A garden that has one flower, well, it's a little bit boring. Diversity is God's gift to each one of us. Don't be afraid to shine and be who you were created to be. And side note, as I finish off, if you think the 2SLGBT community is strange, those of you who have decided to follow Jesus are increasingly the weird ones. Those of us who say there is another way to live, a way of love instead of hatred, a way of peace instead of violence, trying to solve the world's problems with violence and more violence, a way of forgiveness instead of being trapped by resentments and grudges, a way of letting go of our false self and living into our true self, in following Jesus, nothing could be more strange and more wonderful, more life-giving. Thanks be to God. Amen.